So welcome everyone to today's super exciting Bramberg lunch and seminar around how COVID-19 is supercharging geopolitics, global health and the Swedish exception. This Bramberg lunch is hosted by MSD Research Institute of Sweden and the INPRESS. 2020 has not been like any other years, not at least in the last 100 years. It's been extremely challenging for all of us and not at least for the healthcare system where we have seen heroic contributions by physicians and nurses among others. But the economic crisis that has arised from this pandemic has also been compared to the big depression back from the 1930s. And with that comes socio-economic growing gaps and also much more nationalism. We will talk more about that today. I think we all have an obligation to do whatever we can and learn from this pandemic to stay better prepared for the future. And that's why we are so extremely happy to have the best panelists and experts here with us today to dig deeper into this topic. So today's Bramberg lunch is divided into three sections. We'll start with our keynote speaker, followed by the managing director of MSD, and then we will finalize with a long discussion with our expert panelists. So I trust we will have a really exciting Bramberg lunch today. And uh, by that, I welcome everyone on behalf of uh, MSD. And Peter, please. I will also uh, grant you welcome to this Braunberg lunch from RISE Research Institutes of Sweden. We are co-hosting this Braunberg lunch on a very relevant theme for 2020. Um, research Institutes of Sweden uh, is a research institute working with applied science and innovation. And in the COVID-19 situation, we have done a lot of projects coupled to, uh, to innovation and how we can solve uh, things in this specific situation. It ranges from how we can uh, certify medical devices, uh, how we work with digital health, uh, how we can disseminate knowledge about digitalization in Sweden, how we can use that as a tool in this uh, pandemic. Uh, this is a very exciting brown bag lunch that takes a quite holistic perspective uh, on when it comes to the geopolitics and working with the Swedish, Swedish exception. So with that said, I will leave to Marie to introduce the moderator. Thank, Thank you, you, Peter. So it's my great pleasure to introduce and welcome our keynote speaker of today and the moderator, Mr. Alistair Ross. So Alistair, you're the country's editor of the Economist Intelligence Unit. You do have a speci uh, special knowledge in global economy, operational risk, and also business strategy. You hold a master in economics and also psychology graduate. Uh, you're a business journalist and you've been writing for major newspapers across the world with a special interest in Latin America. So welcome up on stage, Alistair. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's uh, absolutely fantastic uh, to be here. It's uh, fantastic to be anywhere, to be honest, uh, that's not uh, locked down UK at the moment. So uh, a real pleasure to be in, in uh, Stockholm with you. Um, I'm going to be talking about geopolitics and how it's interacted with the epidemic and how that's sort of spinning uh, the scenarios for the, for the geopolitical future for our world. Um, of course, geopolitics didn't begin uh, in March this year. It's, uh, there's been a, a lot of geopolitical trends already well underway. Uh, that we've been thinking about and talking about in recent years. You might say uh, that when COVID-19 struck the world, uh, it found the world with a series of pre-existing conditions. Um, we had the emergence of China, uh, the reorientation of American policy both at home and abroad. We have long-term trends such as uh, demographic change with uh, aging populations in many parts of the world. Uh, and we have threats like climate change um, and the shift uh, away from oil to renewables. So these are all themes that were already in the air and, and, and uh, developing um, before 
COVID came. But then uh, the epidemic struck and it felt, I think, in that moment as if everything slowed down, everything almost came to a stop. Certainly in my country, we were locked down and uh, told to stay at home. Um, but of course, those underlying trends continued as they always would. Um, and the fact is that in some cases, the epidemic has focused our attention on some of these underlying geopolitical trends. And in some cases, it's actually picked up the trends and accelerated them. Um, and that's what I want to talk about today. I want to go through some of these major uh, underlying global trends that, are, that are, uh, will affect all of us over the coming years. So if we move on to the first of them, um, I've called it uh, Cold War II. Um, I'm, okay, a little bit tongue-in-cheek with the use of that, uh, of that phrase. Uh, the first Cold War was uh, one that we, um, I think probably most of us in this room and, and on, uh, on the screens remember. Um, and the situation in many ways was different. We were coming out of a, of a world war and uh, so on and so forth. But the idea of two um, opposing visions of the world, two opposing ideologies confronting each other across the planet, that is uh, common. And that's, that's uh, the, the shape of things now. We have uh, China on the one hand, the US on the other. And the epidemic has come uh, at a time when tensions were already on the rise between these two powers. Uh, and it's actually accelerated uh, the uh, the aggression uh, and given it a new language. Um, the U.S. president used uh, quite um, inflammatory words to describe the virus, calling it, for example, the China virus. And I think this was phrased um, deliberately to evoke the idea of a purposeful Chinese assault on uh, the US economy and the US way of life. Um, and China, for its part, has also been more aggressive. It's uh, used this, this, this moment when its own development was suddenly in contrast uh, with the rest of the world. First of all, being hit by the virus and being the source of the virus. And, and secondly, getting very quick control of it uh, as the rest of the world took off and saw its own surge. So China has used this contrast in its fortunes um, to be more aggressive, I think, generally up to now, over the past 30 years of continual uh, growth, China's been quite uh, qu quite uh, circumspect in the way it's engaged with the world. But I think we heard some more intemperate language from uh, Xi Jinping uh, over the last few months. Um, he, there was a, a, a blank denial of accusations backed up by uh, video footage of uh, human rights abuses in uh, in Xinjiang province in northwest China against the Uyghurs, um, the, uh, the Hong Kong protests, pro-democracy protests, were met with a new se draconian security law. And uh, there have been prov provocative uh, exercises in the South China Sea. Um, so the competition isn't new, but I think it's become far more explicit under the Trump administration with attempts uh, to cajole China into a global order dominated by Western governments and ideas dead in the water. I think we felt uh, for some time until uh, Donald Trump came along that uh, China could be embraced and brought somehow to the within the fold. Uh, and I think there's been a very clear change in focus and in rhetoric uh, under the Trump administration. And that option uh, no longer appears to be on the table. Uh, China's also used the opportunity provided by the COVID outbreak uh, to reinforce its soft power. As I said, China's becoming more assertive and more public in its, uh, in its um, uh, intention to gain influence around the world. Uh, and uh, you'll remember very early on in the, in the outbreak when Italy in Europe was, at the, uh, you know, was, the, was the focus of the, uh, of the epidemic. Uh, China sent medical aid and sent a, a plane full of medical aid uh, in a very sort of well-publicized move uh, to Italy at a time when Italy perhaps was feeling a little forsaken by its European allies, uh, who at that point were still uh, searching for a common response. So China wasn't uh, hesitant at all in using this opportunity uh, to make a point and to drive a wedge between uh, allies uh, and, its, and its rivals. Um, 
At the same time, uh, as China is becoming more assertive, uh, America's global em- influence appears to be waning as uh, Mr. Trump reorients uh, American policy towards this concept of America first. Uh, it's not so much that Washington is neglecting the rest of the world, but he's he's shifting focus uh, to Asia uh, from the Middle East and Russia, and showing less of the benevolent spirit that we that we saw established by America after the Second World War with uh, the Marshall Plan and the creation of the uh, global m- uh, post-war order. Uh, under Woodrow Wilson. And this is now becoming a much harsher world, a more transactional world, uh, where allies feel less safe and less sure of the support of uh, of America. Um, as with the first Cold War, countries are being uh, asked to pick sides. Uh, it's not that they have to make a single choice, I'm with this side or with the other side, but it's a calculation that every country needs to make uh, as, it, um, as it shapes its own policies. Um, how will this go down in, the, in uh, Beijing or in uh, Washington? Um, and I think the UK, my country, offers a very good example of this in action. Um, the Boris Johnson administration's first instinct was to stick with Huawei, the Chinese supplier of uh, telecoms equipment, uh, for the rollout of 5G. And that was announced and um, they were going to be, they weren't going to be involved in the core infrastructure, but they were going to be a major supplier uh, to the UK telecom sector. Um, Lo and behold, a brief um, interaction with uh, American diplomats later, uh, there was a sudden and complete U-turn. Britain a uh, fairly powerful nation in its own right, had to decide at that point, uh, do we look at our potentially our economic self-interest, uh, which would mean going with Huawei, uh, having this cheaper, um, more readily available equipment ready to install and make a leap forward towards 5G, or do we stick with our American allies and uh, reject Huawei and keep them out of the deal? Um, The EU aspires to be a global force in its own right, and uh, friction with the US is quite clear, I think, but uh, the EU has also recently reoriented its view towards China, uh, declaring China a strategic rival for the first time. So that idea of a fond embrace of an emerging China, well and truly now in the past. And others have been forced to take up uh, align, alignment positions as well. Um, Japan, under new leadership, has recently held a, uh, a meeting where it's drawn together four Western allies with a clear signal to China uh, of which side Japan is on and where its red lines are, which it won't cross. Um, we've seen the sort of opening up of a vacuum, if you like, in some parts of the world uh, that are no longer the central focus of foreign policy in the major capitals. Um, and we've seen countries sort of exploit that additional room for manoeuvre. Um, Russia and Turkey are good examples, both of them seeking greater influence uh, in areas quite distant from their core um, geopolitical concerns. And in fact, now coming up against each other in various places, uh, Libya, uh, Syria, and now Nagorno-Karabakh, the two countries, Russia and Turkey, are taking opposing sides and testing, really, the will of the rest of the world to stop them. Let's move on to the next uh, and somewhat connected um, trend, which is about uh, the digital economy, the digitalization of the world we live in. Um, the first Cold War was very much about the capacity of these two Uh, competing systems to produce hardware, to uh, build tractors, to build rockets and missiles, uh, and to produce food en masse to to feed their populations. Um, And this time isn't really uh, uh, that different. We're not talking about tractors anymore or missiles, but we are talking about data, we're talking about software and hardware, and we're talking in particular about the standards and systems that control the platforms that all of our digital traffic uh, moves on. Um, Digital connectivity is tremendously important, not just because it it offers uh, governments a degree of control and surveillance power within their own borders, but also because 
perhaps like nothing before. It allows uh, states and state-connected actors to project influence way beyond their borders and to get involved in the nitty-gritty, the daily life and the big political moments uh, in countries far and uh, far away from uh, their own borders. Uh, so it, controlling it uh, is key, both controlling what comes in and controlling what's available out there. So it's a real battle. Um, big commercial interests as well, of course. You want to be the country whose companies supply this mass migration uh, online. Uh, I think, again, in this, with this trend, the epidemic has picked up uh, something that was already happening and focused attention on it, but also accelerated it. Um, COVID-19 has offered a, a natural experiment in home working, driving millions online and ramming home uh, the economic importance of connectivity. Many companies, uh, the day after the lockdown, shut their offices and sent everybody home. 15 years ago, that would have been catastrophic. No company could have uh, continued to operate in those conditions. Now, you know, a mere 15 years later, that increase in connectivity and digitalization and people's acceptance that is perfectly, you know, that we all have our phones on us all of the time and we're all always connected meant that that shift from the office to the home uh, was practical. It was practical to do it. And in many cases, the company that I'm involved in um, Clients wouldn't have noticed the difference. Uh, the same analysis was done. The same reports were produced. Uh, we followed the same schedule. So that's an extraordinary uh, shift. But it does highlight how vital to our economies and to our daily lives uh, the internet has become. Um, sadly, the uh, the one of the great benefits of uh, the World Wide Web and the, the Internet, which was this leap in productivity and this adoption of a single common language, uh, HTTP, the protocol uh, on which all um, Internet traffic travels, uh, is now uh, very much under threat. Um, uh, all the world was speaking the same language uh, for the first time, but suddenly we've gone back to uh, to an archipelago of um, of uh, networks uh, that separate from each other, um, and we're not no longer headed toward this great unified uh, world of a free, open, world wide web. Instead of a world wide web, we now have uh, we have the prospect of a west wide web and an east wide web. Uh, and the balkanization of everything in between. Um, and of course, from what was a tremendous accelerator of productivity in the world, that presents a position for businesses in particular, which will be much harder and more expensive to navigate. Let's move on uh, to the next of the trends I want to look at. And this is uh, the role, the identity, uh, the position in the world of Europe. Um, I think the European Union has spent its entire existence looking for an identity for its raison d'etre, for uh, its, its mission, uh, not just within its own borders, but in the world as a whole. And has never quite felt that it's got there comfortably, that it knows what it's for. Uh, and the rest of the world doesn't necessarily know quite what it's for either. Started out as a very narrow trade uh, block, but quite clearly um, from the beginning there was this vision as well of a, a unified Europe where countries were held so close to each other that they couldn't return to the kind of bloody warfare that we had seen very recently, but also that's littered European history for centuries. Um, and in that much, uh, Europe has in, been successful. We've all grown up in a much more peaceful neighborhood than our, uh, than our grandparents and parents did. Uh, so that's very important. Um, but still, this search for a central mission and, and the degree to which European member states can cohere and uh, collaborate with each other without giving up sovereignty, which is, uh, you know, emotionally important as much as anything to their populations. Um, before COVID came along, there'd been two big crises that uh, that either of which could have destroyed uh, Europe. The first, of course, was the financial crash which Europe, uh, in which Europe was hit particularly hard uh, and the associated shaking of the single currency, the Eurozone. Um, and the second was the departure, the vote 
to depart and now the imminent departure of one of the major powers uh, in the European club and one of the major net contributors to the European budget. So a tremendously disruptive moment uh, for the European experiment. Um, from the first of those, the financial crisis, Europe had, was very much in, in recovery mode uh, when, uh, when the epidemic hit. Um, what had been a devastating uh, blow to many of the economies, particularly in the south of Europe, uh, those economies, many of them had come roaring back. Even those that uh, had struggled for longer were more or less back up to where they had been before the financial crisis hit. Um, but then the epidemic came. Uh, and now we look at, again across a, a, a European vista of, of devastation. Um, and it has to be said at the start, the region's response to the ep epidemic was, was poor. Um, I spoke to a, 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 somebody, a representative from the European Commission very recently who described that first step in the response uh, of Europe to the epidemic as cacophony. And I think that's a good uh, description. It was just noise everywhere. Um, no sense of coordination. In fact, quite the opposite. Uh, countries immediately uh, seized up and closed their borders. Um, and there was very little sign at the senior political level of the kind of collaboration and coordination that we had seen after the, the, the financial crisis. Um, different countries were affected different, in different ways at different speeds, and it was left to each country to decide what kind of measures it was going to put in place to protect itself from the spreading epidemic. Um, but when Brussels did finally act and come together, uh, the rescue package that it announced, I think, was unprecedented and a real game changer. Um, it's not so much the size, though 750 billion euros is not a small amount of money. I think we'd all agree on that. Um, so it's not so much the size, um, but it's, uh, it's the nature, the structure of the deal. Uh, in the, you'll remember in the, uh, in the wake of the financial crisis, there was tremendous clamour all over Europe uh, for a coordinated um, financial response where uh, resources would be shifted from the wealthy countries to the poorer struggling countries in one form or another, some form of financial solidarity. And it wasn't really forthcoming. There was a great deal of resistance, heel dragging, uh, particularly in the, in the north, um, about uh, offering this opportunity for moral hazard in southern countries um, uh, with money that belonged to the voters of those governments making the decision. Um, but that changed in this, in this, on this occasion, and it changed fairly quickly. I mean, there was a lot of um, discussion, but Europe generally doesn't move that quickly on things. Uh, on this occasion, uh, it did. And I think that package, as I said, was a real uh, game changer because for the first time, uh, the rich countries, mainly in the north of, uh, of Europe, are using their strong credit worthiness to borrow money on international financial markets, uh, international capital markets, to distribute among poorer countries that outside the European Union would never be able to borrow at those low rates. So this is a kind of, this is the rich countries taking on the risk so that the poor countries can gain the benefit. Um, and that surely is sort of at the very core of what Europe uh, we would imagine Europe should be about. So it seems to me in that moment, uh, it's, it's not the end of the journey for Europe, but it's taken a, a really key turn, I think. And that search for an identity and that solidarity within the group, uh, it's, it's made a big step forward. Uh, helped, perhaps, though it saddens me to say, by the clarity that's come to Europe from the departure of Britain and the urgency that that has given to Europe to get its house in order um, and enhanced by the arrival of COVID. So let's move forward and, and come even closer uh, to home for you uh, here in Stockholm. Um, all of those people who you can see, uh, they may not know it, but they're participating in a giant natural experiment. And the world is watching with great interest to uh, see what becomes of them. Um, 
one of the disappointments for me when uh, the epidemic hit was this lack at a global level of a coordinated response uh, as countries blamed each other for, for what was going on. Um, and then countries each took their own decision on how they would respond. Some went for strict lockdown straight away and some for just a happy-go-lucky denial that anything was happening. Sweden stood out and it chose a policy that was based largely on guidance and on information informing citizens rather than on laying down the law in the way uh, that was done in other countries, including, uh, including my own. Uh, it will be some time before we can make any definitive judgments on, on the outcome of uh, this experiment, though all sides are um, already drawing conclusions that uh, categorically support the view that they had before any, any of this started. Uh, the right love the way uh, laissez-faire um, uh, policies in Sweden are being given uh, the lead. Uh, the left look instead at the way Swedes have, have shown this great social solidarity, this sense of community, uh, looking at the same data but drawing very different conclusions. But I think what we can say is that compared to its Nordic neighbours, there hasn't been a miracle here. Um, by the beginning of this month, Sweden had registered nearly twice as many cases as Norway, Finland and Denmark combined, and nearly five times as many deaths. Uh, and on a wider scale, uh, the difference is less extreme, but still, Sweden doesn't perform um, overly well. Among advanced Western nations, only the US has seen more cases per million population than Sweden. And on deaths per capita, only Spain, the UK and Italy scored worse. Two important points in Sweden's favour. One is that because of the more relaxed approach, there's been less need for uh, fiscal resources to be spent on rescuing companies and citizens, um, which stands the fiscal accounts in good stead. I mean, just to give an example, uh, on average among advanced Western nations, uh, countries have spent about 20, uh, nearly a quarter of their GDP in fiscal support packages. Um, Sweden's deficit this year will be around 4%. So it gives you an indication of, of the difference in the burden that this has placed on Sweden. The other thing is the question of civil liberties. Uh, Sweden has handed some of the authority for decision making and policy uh, from the government to the scientific community, to the epidemiologists. Uh, and this again is in stark contrast with what's happened in, in many other countries. So we'll go on to the next uh, trends. And uh, the good news is that these are, are all sort of connected with what I've already said. So we'll go through these quite, quite quickly, I think. The first is uh, about globalization and a globalization that's in retreat. Um, globalization gave a great kick to the world economy, uh, making supply chains much more efficient, much longer at the same time. Um, but it was already in retreat and under attack before the virus hit uh, because of the uneven uh, share of the benefits of globalization. And when uh, the virus hit, these were really uh, exaggerated and, and brought more to the fore. And I think now uh, the trend for companies will be to shorten their supply chains, build more resilience into their businesses. And some of that efficiency that we gained through globalization uh, will no doubt be lost. Um, globalization, one of its great achievements was to uh, reduce inequality between nations, though it increased inequality within many nations. Uh, unfortunately, with COVID, we're now seeing inequality grow both within nations and between nations. Uh, and this is one of the um, one of the sad outcomes of the way the virus has, has hit. Let's move on to the next one. Um, as I mentioned before, we came out of the war, uh, a, a world at, at, at the throat, each country at the throat of the other. And a whole series of institutions were formed at, at that point. Um, and we built this kind of multilateral global architecture, uh, which would allow nation states to collaborate with each other to make decisions about what should be done uh, in, a, in a less confrontational way. And they've been, those institutions, uh, the UN, the World Bank, uh, and all of the associated institutions, the IMF, uh, the World Trade Organization, have uh, been governing our lives in a way ever since. 
Uh, but they came under attack again long before COVID arrived. Uh, America saw saw itself as paying for a lot of it, but not getting the benefits. Uh, China saw uh, many of these institutions as a dis- as, as a purpose built straitjacket on China's ability to grow and to uh, reach the size that it and, and influence in the world that it believes it should have. So multilateral institutions already under attack have been further attacked uh, under the epidemic with, for example, um, the American administration announcing its intention to leave the World Health Organization at the height of a global pandemic. Um, so the the multilateral world, the 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 uh, these institutions are under attack and uh, are being shaken by what's happening at the moment. But I think it's also true that they it, it's it, they no longer reflect the world that they were created to help. The world's moved on since the end of the Second World War. The way power is is uh, shared around the world, where wealth sits, these things are all different, and. The structure, the the constitution of these institutions is no longer aligned with the world as it as it exists. So, if we want to save them, we need to allow them to be reformed. But we want that reform to take place uh, in a less antagonistic uh, manner than than is happening at the moment, preferably. Uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about was um, the Western Defence Alliance. So, a big part of this sort of uh, this global post-war architecture has been about, and post-Cold War architecture has been about the defence of the West against perceived threats, um, mainly expressed through NATO. Uh, but NATO already, again, before the virus hit, uh, was charged by Emmanuel Macron, uh, described by him as becoming brain dead, um, while Mr. Trump railed against nations ripping off the Americans uh, by not paying their fair share. Um, as a result, uh, Europe is now looking to come together a little more closely and develop its own uh, defence strategy. Uh, some of that may wane if uh, there's a Biden presidency, and I use the word if, uh, deliberately, because I don't think that's in any way uh, certain. But under Biden, uh, European alliances, the Western alliances, would probably be uh, rebuilt and, and the tone and the mood music would be a lot better. But I think something's changed as well. Uh, the orientation of uh, global threats has changed since NATO was created. And again, new institutions are needed. Let's move on to um, to the last of these trends, um, and this one is a really, I think, a really interesting one, which is very much in development as we speak. Most of the others were pre-existing trends uh, that COVID has sort of picked up and accelerated. This one is a direct result, I think, of the epidemic. Um, and this is the idea that cities, which have been drivers of human ingenuity, innovation, and economic activity uh, for centuries and have been just getting bigger and bigger and bigger are um, now being questioned. The model of bringing lots and lots of people together. Yeah, it's great when you want to have, when you, you want to network and you want to have a brainstorming session to have lots of people who don't know each other all in the same room. But the COVID antigen uh, pathogen takes one look at that and says, "I like the look of these places. That's where I'm going to start my journey through the through the uh, around the planet." And so it has been. Uh, London, Stockholm, New York uh, have all seen um, great concentrations of uh, of the uh, of infection. So cities do pool talent and they ferment creativity, but they also shuffle millions of people into these very uh, fragile environments when it comes to health. And we have seen, there's, a, there's, there's uh, an, lots of anecdotal evidence of people beginning to say, well, if I, don't, if I can work at home and I don't need to be, go to the office, why do I need to live here? Why do I need to live in this tiny box, really expensive, surrounded by lots of noise and lots of other people, if I don't need to get on a train and, and go to the go to the office. So there's been something of a reverse migration out of cities. Speaking from purely selfish point of view, uh, I really enjoy my life in the country. So I'm rather hoping that all the people who live in cities will stay there. 
and uh, and and stick to their guns on on uh, the advantages of city dwelling. There are so many other things that I could talk about, and no doubt we will in the uh, Q and A that's coming up. Um, but for there, I'll leave it. Thank you very much. So first of all, thank you, Alistair, for a stellar presentation. I think we can discuss this for hours or days or even weeks. Uh, later on in the panel discussion, we will try to understand how these global trend, trends actually resonate with the challenges we are facing in Sweden and the healthcare system specifically. Uh, so now uh, I would like to introduce uh, the managing director for MSD up on stage. So Sarah Eosa has been leading the MSD Sweden affiliate since February uh, through unprecedented times, I would say. And this summer you uh, uh, came to Stockholm together with your family from US and you can tell the rest of the <laughs> audience about that. I think uh, Sarah holds a Master of Public Health from Johns Hopkins University and you also have a Bachelor in Biology. Uh, with your broad and long experience in global strategic roles, but also country operational roles. It will be extremely interesting to listen uh, to you, uh, your reflections on the global trends and how you believe that the pharmaceutical industry can contribute to the pandemic and have contributed. So I will hand over to you and uh, Alistair. Great. Thank you, Marie. Thank you again, Alistair. I could listen to you for hours with uh, your insights and I look forward to our exchange as well. So I thought I'd start by sharing a little bit about our company and then telling you about MSD's response to the pandemic and then, uh, and then we can go from there. So, you know, MSD for well over a century has been inventing for life and we have been helping to solve the uh, global challenges around health and population problems, that's our expertise. And I would say that we feel it's our responsibility to improve lives of patients, but also to contribute to society as a whole. And we do this through the vaccines and the medicines and the animal health products that we deliver. Globally, our company is made up of over 70,000 employees and we invest over nearly $10 billion in research and development. From a local perspective here in Sweden, our employees number around 140 across human and animal health, and our investment in research is four times our business footprint, so quite sizable. Now you may ask how we have responded to the pandemic, and I would say that our response has been focused in four key areas. The first of which is to protect our employees and their families. The second is really around ensuring no patient is left behind and supporting our healthcare professionals and the communities. The third, of course, is supply. I mean, I would say that should be the first, right? That we really think that it's so important to ensure uninterrupted access to our medicines and our vaccines. And lastly, it's around contributing our scientific expertise to advance research so we can respond to the pandemic. So let me just touch briefly upon each of these points. From an employee perspective, we talked about the urban decay and how everyone sort of locked down and raced home at the start of the pandemic. And certainly we did as well. But we actually find that the office is a key workplace, a key place to be with our employees. And we've carefully reopened. We follow, of course, the Swedish uh, public health authority guidelines carefully and adapt accordingly. But we thought we would offer a safe environment for the employees that needed to come to the office and have that work workplace and exchange. And so we've implemented social distance measures. We've restricted outside guests, which is why we're all here today as well. And so we've taken those careful steps to ensure that our employees can focus on the great work that they do each day and not have to worry about the pandemic when they come to the office. So that's the first. The second, coming back to supply. I am so grateful to our colleagues in supply working closely with manufacturing and with our affiliates across the world to really secure the important supply of our medicines and vaccines. And I'm proud to say that since the pandemic started, we faced no shortage of any of our critical products. So that's really great news. 
The third area has to do with the way we support our healthcare providers and our patients. Just to give you some examples, our clinical trial operations and closely working with regulatory as well, they made sure that they adapted the way that we monitor trials, for example, digitally if we had to because some of the clinics were closed. But we had to make sure that no patients were left behind and that our research could continue uninterrupted. So we're quite used to responding to global challenges such as this one. And with that said, we acquired a company called Themis, based out of Austria, to develop one vaccine candidate. We have another vaccine candidate in partnership with IAVI, which is formerly known as the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative. And these are based on established platforms. And then we also have a collaboration with Ridgeback Bio for an oral antiviral treatment. And then lastly, we're part of a global consortium in collaboration with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, and that's to assess additional vaccine candidates and therapeutics. So th that's how our company has responded. Globally, we've donated over $30 million to uh, COVID relief efforts, including donations of personal protective equipment. And at the local level, we've actually also had our employees volunteer to help set up temporary clinics. And any employee that is licensed as a healthcare professional, whether that's a nurse, a physician, a laboratory professional, could volunteer and provide service, helping to respond to the pandemic. So I'm super proud to be part of the Swedish experiment, uh, as well as you mentioned, Alistair. And I'm quite privileged to be working alongside our colleagues, and I hope to have a, pa a positive and lasting impact in Sweden with the work that we do. Contribute to a healthy Sweden. We can recover from this for today and tomorrow. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, that was sort of fairly comprehensive, uh, but it does leave me with, a, with pondering a, a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, if you had to sort of s compress everything mm -hmm. and say, okay, what are the key takeaways? that your company has, uh, has derived from this extraordinary experience. How would you characterize that? It's a great question. I would say it's quite striking if you think about how quickly our industry and our company has mobilized in response. So what I mean by that is very, in a short few months after the virus emerged, the scientists were able to analyze it, decode it, and then identify multiple viable pathways for research. Some of the research pathways that we've undertaken come out of that important research work. So I think a key takeaway is that it underscores the importance of continuing to invest in research and development, but it also underscores the importance of multiple collaborations, science, we can't do it alone. So we're all in this together and we have to partner and collaborate and build the plane as we're flying it to get to a solution to end this crisis. Um, good, thank you. Um, I, one of the things I noticed I thought was, was very interesting was that, you know, in the, at the beginning of this, it was clear that a vaccine was going to be key to bringing the uh, epidemic under control. And all the major uh, pharmaceutical companies in the world, many laboratories around the world, sort of jumped right into this race, if you like, uh, to come up with the, the first vaccine. Yeah. Uh, and we see tremendous pressure being put in America on, on um, uh, the health uh, uh, community to jump hurdles and get a, vi a vaccine into circulation. Uh, MSD didn't take that approach. MSD didn't jump straight in. What, why and what approach have you taken? So I think it's uh, a little bit of um, a disservice, and I'll use that word because our CEO has used that word in talking about this. I think it's a disservice to the global population to think that there's a solution to this problem. There's multiple solutions that we have to take to offer a wide range of vaccines and treatments to help combat this issue. So I think I would say what makes me proud to work here, and it's really about MSD's rich legacy. I mean, we've developed so many vaccines over the course of the years, for example, the Ebola virus, and we've also treated infectious disease for years. So we have this deep expertise, and it allowed us to be really deliberate and thoughtful to search for platforms that were based on established vaccine um, you know, uh, science. So for example, the two candidates that we have that are advancing through 
through preclinical and clinical work are based on established measles-based platforms as well as established Ebola virus-based platforms. So that allowed us to ensure that we are not um, racing and sacrificing safety and the quality and science for speed. Right, good, thank you. Um, uh, another of the sort of trends that was around before this even hit uh, was, the, was, was the questioning that was being done of, of vaccines as a technology. So there was the anti-vax movement that was picking up quite a lot of, of pace. And, and yet, uh, one way or another, uptake of a vaccine is, it could well be critical in uh, the situation we find ourselves in. How do you work as a company to build confidence in, in a vaccine? And more generally, perhaps you could talk about uh, the picture for vaccines, the outlook, uh, where you, what you think is going to happen and when. So I think it's related to the last question as well. I think research in vaccines and gaining approval of vaccines, they're really just the initial steps. Acceptance and wide access, uh, of course, and wide uptake, those are the keys as well to population health. And I think that that's where we build upon our deep uh, expertise and legacy here to partner with all actors, global, regional, local, politicians, patients, to combat some of the misinformation that's out there that's spread through, for example, social media. We talked about uh, cyberspace earlier. And the challenge with that is that there is so much misinformation. And if we do race and do sacrifice science and uh, for the sake of speed, it's going to contribute further to that. Right. So that's why it's so important that we partner with all these actors and provide the important education, but also we as a company have to hold ourselves and continue to do so to the highest standards. You may have seen the pledge that MSD has signed along with many other companies in this industry. And the most important way to earn trust is to offer solutions that are based in research and that offer effective and safe options. Uh, and what do you think about uh, the, the, the landscape at the moment in vaccine research uh, related to COVID? Where, where do we stand in that uh, progression towards a suite of, of uh, safe and effective vaccines? I think we're making great progress. Mm. I'm very optimistic. I think that we will have multiple solutions uh, and some of that data will start reading out. And we applaud our partners that are all racing toward this effort. I mentioned that we're all flying different planes, but we're all in the air and piloting toward a solution. So I do, again, I'm very optimistic about the outlook and I do think that we'll have many options available to help with this pandemic and certainly help us prepare for future health crises like antibiotics resistance. That's also something that keeps us up at night. Well, that's great, and in, in part because it, it chimes with the assumptions I'd made before I did my presentation. So if you'd been pessimistic, I would have had to go back and change everything <laughs> I said. Um, well, okay, finally, I mean, I, I, I talked a, a little bit flippantly about the Swedish experiment mm -hmm. and uh, the experience of the Swedish um, population and, and their authorities. Uh, but it is really striking that there is something different here, not just in the choices, the policy choices that have been made, but how the population has responded to those choices. Um, I came via Greece and I've been wearing a mask virtually permanently for the last week. And I got off the plane at, at uh, Orlando and realized I was the only person in the whole country wearing a mask. So, uh, so I took mine off. Mm. So clearly there's something different. What have you, I mean, you're, you're new to the country as well, in a, in a sense, you've been here a few months in August, months. yes. Uh, but long enough to start to pick up uh, the vibe. So what have you learned, would you say, about Swedish values in your time here and in the context of this epidemic? So it's a great question. I'm most impressed by uh, the values of egalitarianism, of mutual respect and consideration, of the trust that um, the people here have for non-government and government uh, actors and the transparency, the hard work ethic. So these are all values that I think are super impressive and coming from America where it's quite chaotic right now. I think uh, I personally am quite relieved to be here with my family and my young children uh, to be amongst uh, all of uh, the Swedish population. And I just think that it offers such a unique approach uh, to be able to do the great work that our employees do every day. 
Great. That's a, that's a good answer and uh, one that will not lose you any friends <laughs> uh, in Sweden, which is important. Yeah. Okay, that's it. Thank you so much, uh, you. Sarah. That, that was really, really interesting. Thanks Thank a lot. Thank you, Alistair. Thank you. So now we take just a few minutes break and uh, ensure that the uh, fantastic panel comes up on stage. So I will ask the panelists uh, to go uh, to the technique hotspot and get your microphones on and then we'll be back in a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Um, we're now ready for the panel discussion segment of our uh, of our day. Um, I think we're going to carry on with a global uh, perspective, but we're going to drill in much deeper uh, into the Swedish experience too. So uh, it should be wide ranging, uh, stimulating, and interesting. Those are your marching orders. Um, <laughs> So I'm really, really happy that we have a great uh, panel of tremendous collection of expertise up here with me. Uh, I, first of all, I'd like to introduce uh, Stefan Svartling Pedersen, who is Professor in Global Health at Uppsala University and former Chief of Health at UNICEF. Um, we have B. Puranen, uh, who's Secretary General of the World Values Survey. If I leave anything out, please feel free to add it. Uh, we have Ole Peter Ottersen, who is president of the Karolinska Institute. Uh, busy days at the moment because you have the Nobel um, Prize uh, process underway. And we have, uh, last but certainly not least, we have Jenny Nordeberg, who's the head of Swedish, the Swedish government's Office for Life Sciences. So as you can see, a superb array of uh, expertise here on the panel. Now, just to reassure you all that at the end, I'm going to give you an opportunity to sum up and to you know fill in any points that you feel have been missed. Uh, but let's start out um, with this sort of general question. Uh, the most surprising and important lessons that we've learned about healthcare and sustainable development globally and in Sweden uh, during this extraordinary episode. Uh, I'm going to start with Stefan for this one. So you want to... Lovely. I, I observed this uh, as Chief of Health for UNICEF, so that was a, an extremely interesting vantage point. Uh, but I'd, I'd like to say that it's those mega trends and a couple of others that you started off with that actually created the vulnerability for COVID, the urbanization, the sedentarism, the commercialization of food that we're all ballooning around the world, uh, etc. And, and then it was the encroachment in the habitat uh, of animals that actually allowed the virus to jump, and it found, as you rightly said, a very fertile ground. Uh, so uh, that made, allowed it to become a fast epidemic. But it's very much many of the same drivers that allow slow epidemics. Uh, I think we heard about the antibiotic resistance, which is a slow pandemic, w mm -hmm. which is uh, coming to bite us on, on, on a slower scale. So to me, it's about tackling these determinants that allowed COVID to happen, but that also allow the real issue, because COVID is a rehearsal for climate change and biodiversity loss and the real challenges. And it's tackling the same determinants that we need to do that allowed COVID to prosper, actually to make the, the systems transformation. Uh, and that's where I find that, and, and I'm no longer representing UNICEF, uh, I must say then, that the populist nationalistic era we're in now makes us extremely vulnerable to this because we're not in a position to deal with global threats. We have nationalist solutions to global issues and global challenges. And you referred to sort of every country locking up and hugging your own primary PPE and vaccine nationalism as we'll go forward, etc. And I think those are the real challenges that we're f failing to take on, really. Uh, and I think we're taking them on much better at local level not yet very well at national level and not at all at global level. And we need global multi-sectoral governance for health. And I'm deliberately saying health and not healthcare. Mm -hmm. Because arguably WHO is about governance for healthcare. And I'm hoping that Helen Clark and, and, uh, and uh, Johnson Sirleaf Commission will actually be able to go beyond the nar narrow blame game on COVID to actually suggest a governance mechanism for health, because that's what we urgently need. Global challenges need global solutions. Right. Um, I couldn't agree more. It's uh, uh, really interesting insights. Uh, B, I'd like to ask you the same question. So uh, the, the important lessons, but maybe the surprising ones as well, ones that you might not have anticipated before all of this kicked off. Well, um, it was enough just listening to the, the news on the radio this morning when uh, Donald Trump said, don't be afraid of the virus. 
I mean, uh, it really connects to what you talked about with uh, with um, uh, populism coming up and and with uh, talking about what do we really know and what is fake news. Uh, that is the most surprising part for me. I mean, I've been working with epidemics and pandemics for the whole of my life. I did my PhD on tuberculosis, and I can recognize a lot of things that happen in people's reaction when it comes to tuberculosis, to the Spanish flu, and to many other diseases during the decades afterwards. That people are quite the way we react is almost the same. It's uh, it, and, and and if we learn a bit more about the human reactions to something, for example, a country like Sweden, where we have very high levels of trust, a high confidence in 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 our institutions, in our authorities, we get young people who are trustful, and being trustful also means you are not worried, and that means that you may be not be so careful with uh, being together with other youngs because. You are young, so it will not hit you that hard, and you are trustful. Uh, so one of the scary and surprising things for me is the that we so fast divided the society into the youngsters, where 80% of the youngest youngsters in, in uh, many countries, not just in Sweden, when we do the COVID-19 invest investigations, which we are doing right now, uh, they are not worried. While the people above 50, mm. where you have people getting dying actually, people are really worried and then you have this huge divide in society and then to add on to that you have a political system acting in a way which really was a big, big surprise. Here we thought we had systems for epidemiologic fights and the pandemics, how to fight pandemics, where we had agreed in all countries, WHO is doing a fantastic work. And then suddenly, a lot of countries, the politicians just started to do their lockdowns so they didn't co contact each other. So that's also that our system is really so fragile. That's, so these are the three mm. big surprises, I believe. Just to just to press you on one of those, I mean, you talked about this sort of generational um, uh, division, uh, which are, which, which uh, has been a really striking uh, and quite painful uh, observation to make about this process. Do you think it's uh, a justified division on the basis of judgments that you know young people are making about what what? is being asked of them or do you think it's a it's irrational given the situation we're in if you're young it's quite rational to to react the way you do because you're not hit and that is the problem and then you come to the next next thing and that is discernment i mean you need to to have a good judgment uh, how to behave because most likely you have a grandma, grandfather, etc. You have a lot of elderly people around you. So we come to the question of, of uh, um, uh, tolerance is created when we have a take responsibility for each other. I mean, we have a triptych, we have the security leads to trust, which leads to tolerance. And we have young people with security, with high level of trust. But what about the tolerance for the ones who suffers, the elderly? I think that's where we should put our focus. Uh, if we do not do that, we will we will not it will take unnecessary long time to 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 fix this pandemic. Right. Um Jenny, I want to move on to a different question uh, for you. So if you'd just been thinking through how you were going to answer that question. I have to say that. Hard luck. <laughs> yeah. Um I I talked in in my presentation about uh about the the growing gap, uh, so the inequality uh, increasing uh, wi within countries and between countries as a result of the epidemic, um, accelerating trends that were already there. What, what needs to happen, uh, do you think, to address that trend and that sense of a, a, a government's sense in today's world that its primary responsibility is to make sure it doesn't screw up within its own borders and the cost that that may have in terms of acceptance and sharing of vaccines? Yes, uh, and from from my perspective, and I should stress that I'm a civil servant within the government offices, I can't really speak for the uh, political divide, but uh, in that respect, and building out what B has said, I think that the most important part uh, for, for the political level is really maintaining uh, equality on that sense that we still keep the trust base uh, from, uh, from society. And we have seen so many fantastic examples that actually can enable better equality on that sense. 
problems that we have been struggling with for decades in the transformation on how we actually work within healthcare and home care as a whole. Uh, and as you, you so very well showed us in the, in the initial presentation of that how digitization, digitalization really has leapfrogged now. Uh, we totally managed to mm. implement those tools right away on a regional level, not on a national or a global level that we had been working challenging with so much. I'd like to come but back on on digitalization a little yeah. later because it's mm. a really important theme and I think we should give it uh, you know, proper emphasis. So, um, but, but, but my point is really digitization is also a tool towards maintaining right. inequality in right. that sense. But the thing about, about that is, is also that we have to make data-driven uh, decisions and data-driven innovation. And that is something that really strikes me during this pandemic that we all gathered up at two o'clock uh, for, for the press conference from the agencies to look at the data to look at the global data and see where the trends are going. I think that that, that is also uh, a good way of working uh, towards uh, maintaining equality, is that everybody can share and, and have mm -hmm. access to the data in that sense. And that worries me. Do you, uh, think, do you think the data has led us down a bit? I mean, I have a sense, I have no idea um, the basis for this, but it's very, very clear that at the beginning, when, as you say, there was this almost obsessive, concentration and focus among all of us. As I said, we became epidemiologists overnight, all of us, and we wanted to see the data. And yet, in hindsight, it's very clear that an awful lot of the data we were seeing, so beautifully presented, was just completely wrong yes. and, and, you know, off track. Mm. Is, was that inevitable? And, and was there a better way, perhaps, in dealing with the, the gap between the apparent certainty that the data gave us and the real degree of uncertainty that was that was out there from my perspective it's always uh, super important to know what data that you are looking at and really presenting that in the contest context uh, really to meet the uh, to ma maintain the trust base on that sense we knew that that initial data was only uh, for a small part of on the population that had been tested mm. and we've then been d discussing so much how can we really compare data between regions between groups between our uh, nations because we measured that in in so many different ways but i think uh, in uh, in retrospective, I still think that it's important, in, in my view, uh, to, to be up, able to look at and trace uh, the, the data in that sense. And I think that this is an area where Sweden can actually could move forward so much faster in enabling access to more data to take better decisions in right. this way. Okay, great. We've certainly got the right panel uh, to, to consider that. Um, Oli, Peter, I'd like to ask you the same question that I asked Jenny is my country first attitude and, and the potential for that to set up barriers to the solutions that we need uh, to begin to reduce this inequality uh, and this, this uh, uneven impact that COVID has had around the world. Yes, indeed, this is a very <coughs> important and uh, essential question, I would say. Um, as you pointed out in, in your introduction, what we have seen as a result of the pandemic is that inequities, they are not only propagated, they are increased. Yeah. We see a deepening of the inequities uh, worldwide. In fact, I was reminded of uh, a quote when you spoke. Uh, in the midst of my childhood, I remember a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. just after he got the Nobel Peace Prize in 1964. I remember it well. Not in detail, but he said, of all forms of inequality, injustice in health and in healthcare is the most shocking and inhuman. That was a beautiful quote, and I mm. think we should remember this to the day. Mm. Because as was pointed out, um, what we have seen, also our scientists obviously at Karolinska Institute, is that uh, we have inequities that we cannot ignore any longer, because they are accentuated by, by COVID-19. We're talking about inequities when it comes to access to te technology, which I know is one of your fields of interest. Mm. We see it when it comes to access to clean water, to resources, 
Um, we see it also when it comes to the effect of not having access to schools. Imagine what is happening in many countries uh, uh, around the world when children are not, because of lockdown, any longer admitted to schools. And you know, this doesn't hurt us that much because we have all these fantastic systems, technology, we can work back from home. This is not the case in many other parts of the world. So we have to attend to the inequities that uh, we really see uh, now in uh, the wake of um, COVID-19. What you talked about in your introduction is key to some of the solutions that we have to uh, look at. And that is, of course, what is happening at the supranational level. I mean, a global problem has to find global solution. And uh, in fact, I'm writing uh, today a paper on uh, what that has the title Global Transformation for Health, because that is exactly what we need. It's not about reforming the healthcare system. We need a complete global transformation for health. Mm -hmm. When you look into all political sectors, when you look at how technology is being distributed around the world, when we look at uh, how to deal with lockdowns when it comes to psychological measures, for example, I mean, this is an enormous challenge that is far beyond what the healthcare system can possibly mm -hmm. solve. We have to look at this in a cross-sectoral fashion. And unfortunately, what I find to be one of the most disappointing um, events during this pandemic is what I call the implosion of the global governance system for health. Yeah. And of course, we now what really is perhaps the most concrete uh, example, and that is what was done with WHO. 16% of the budget of WHO comes normally from the US and now this funding line has been severed. This is not how we should proceed. Because you, you talked about wars. I would go back to one war you didn't mention, but which is so important. And that is the 30 years war in Europe, ending 1648. Because what happened then? We got the Westphalian nation state, which should take care of the health of its population. That was one of the mm. essence. Uh, that was an essence of the uh, post-Westphalian nation state. And now we see that many nation states are not able to do so because a breakdown of the global governance system for health. Stefan, your thoughts? I wanted to quarrel with you because you labeled something the Swedish experiment. And I wanted to argue that it's in fact the world which is making an experiment, mm -hmm. shutting 1.6 billion kids out of school. Mm -hmm. And actually, it's also a gendered experiment because you're asking the mothers to take care of all of those kids as well. And, and that's going to be the real cost, I think, when we sum up this a couple of years from now. The fact that we've lost a generation, because I would quarrel with you too. Even my son, at, at, who goes to a secondary school in Sweden, and has all the technology and all of these things, has had issues learning via distance, because Sweden did close secondary schools, uh, as you know. And I think 80% of kids around the world say that they haven't learned since then. Mm -hmm. But it's also the child pregnancies, the child labor, uh, all the girls not returning to school, it's the mental health issues, etc. So the world is conducting a huge experiment, and 600 million kids are still subjected to that because their schools are closed. And the only control, Jenny, was Sweden, mm -hmm. and we failed to document the transmission effects of open schools. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to pick on you and quarrel with you as well as representative mm -hmm. of government. Uh, and, and I, I think also quarreling with our hosts here. I, I think we do have a society where it's not just the old people that don't count in Sweden. It's also the young people. Children don't count. They don't have a voice, uh, which we need to amplify in a new way. They don't get new drugs developed to our host. <laughs> and there are no pediatric formulations. We're also failing to develop new antibiotics to take on major childhood killers, etc. And we're failing to, do Jenny, to document these things. So. <laughs> There's lots to do. Mm -hmm. Th there's lots to do. And if I can build on that, completely agree with you. And I think that normally would, we would look at science in Sweden. We can always trace that because we have the personal identification numbers. Ten years from now, we will totally understand what happened and how it evolved. What we would have need to do is really to work on the real world data. We need to make changes now for the future, for the younger generation, uh, if, uh, to, to build their trust uh, for the future, for, for the future society. 
already. Uh, so I can't take an opposed position here, sorry. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm going to consider myself and everybody else uh, du duly chastised. Um, I'm going to blame the hosts because they're the only ones who aren't here to defend themselves. Um, let's uh, move on. Um, not going to move on very far because a lot of what you've talked about is irrelevant to my next question. At the panel discussions like this, there is a, there is a fatal flaw and, and uh, a, a problem that often comes up, which is really easy for us to sort out the world's problems uh, here and then leave and actually nothing has changed. So I want to ask uh, each of you briefly, uh, starting with you, uh, B, what is the potential role here? Where can Sweden take a lead? What can actually be done? An awful lot of what we're talking about is already too late. So things have already happened. So where does Sweden have the, the, the potential to lead? Thank you for that question. And um, I hope you, you will not quarrel with me, Stefan. <laughs> 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 I'm the only one, I believe you did not. But it, to add on to the, that, what, what we can do. Well, actually, I, I do agree with you, of course, when it comes to the young people, because they are the future. And I work at an institute for future studies, so they are really the main target. But by having more than 20% of our population being over 65, we really need to solve that. And I think that could be a potential where Sweden could step in and do... I mean, we wanted to do a lot in the beginning of the 90s when we did a reform, the adult reform, uh, for elderly people to, to be able to live like civil people persons and to say that being old is not um, a, a disease and of course that's absolutely true but we are more vulnerable when we are aging so we need so what we could do is to to when it comes to to that part and i believe the the statistics that we have is not because the swedish system has failed no way it is because when we look at the posi social positioning of people being 70 plus Sweden is very low. We used to be very high on most issues, and we are, but we are not when it comes to social positioning of elderly. So if we could focus on that, that's one very important thing to do, to focus on the social positioning of elderly people and do what is needed. And it does not contradict having a focus on the young people, but I would say we are a bit better with young people when it comes to, to because we kind of realize that they are the future. Uh, secondly, I believe that when we look at... Um, uh, social values, we know that if we can't keep the trust up, uh, we will also fail. So, And we have here some kind of very uh, sensitive stuff. Uh, the level of, of trust and confidence is varying widely around the world. We have uh, more than one million migrants coming from areas in the world where you have very low level of trust. Uh, and this affects also health issues. For example, when we look at ABR, antibiotic resistance, Sweden is at the top level. Because and the Nordic countries, because we have a trust in what the doctors say, what the healthcare systems say, mm -hmm. and we act accordingly. If you come from a country where you do not have that uh, trust, you you will you will do like someone around in your in your own group tells you to do, not what the physician said. If it's yeah. something, so so that's another second thing where we need to 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 work. With. How to get our non uh, non European migrants. Uh, integrated, in, included into our society with specific educational programs because we will not be able to keep the high level of trust up if we do not also focus on and let them come in. And that goes together with what you say about equality because, uh, and that could be a third part, but I guess you would like to talk about that, so I don't take it. But I think these, uh, the, the basic level of trust and, and um, affects so many other things, not just the, the uh, ABR, it affects the whole life. So, so that is a vital area to focus on. And then the elderly people, these two we, we need to take care of. Of course, there are hundreds of more things. I, I know we'll come back to, to digitalization, which is, of course, also mm. a very important part in this. Yeah. Uh, Ole Peter, I'd like to ask you your view on this. Yeah, what can Sweden do was that uh, yeah. question. Well, you, you refer to another um, person saying that we should not be afraid of the uh, coronavirus. We all know who came up with that uh, statement. I think we in Sweden, you, we should do exactly the opposite. We should be afraid of the coronavirus. We should be humble in our approach to the coronavirus and to other viruses of the same kind. To be humble is to look into what we don't know. 
to do research on those issues that need to be researched in order to be bit better prepared. And we have a fantastic opportunity here in Sweden now. We have so many universities, which are, I would say, pretty good uh, in an international standard. I think we, sh we should push ahead for a collaboration between the different universities here in Sweden to build preparedness for the next pandemic through research and innovation. And in fact, we have a pretty new institute that uh, could be a pioneer in doing so, site, uh, Swedish Institute for Global Health Transformation. Uh, this institute could easily serve as a sort of network linking the different universities uh, together. I think that Sweden could take a leading position in, in fact, doing research for better preparedness for health. This is exactly what we need to do now. But then we need interdisciplinary research. We, we need the economists of uh, Stockholm University. We need uh, those who are into technology in K KTH. We, think we need also, of course, biology and medicine. But we need all the different disciplines working together. For example, how should we tell next time around the politicians? What is the balance here? What is the health benefit, but also the health impact of locking down a society or closing schools mm. so that your son will not be able to really perform as well as he could otherwise do? I mean, these are essential questions and we are currently at a loss as to how to respond when a politician, for example, asks us about the health benefit and health impacts of uh, unemployment or isolation and this kind of thing. Right. I, I, the focus, this focus is interesting, I think, on the next pa uh, ep epidemic, because for sure there will be one. Um, uh, Stefan, what's your view here? No, I think we're living the other pandemics already. They right. might be slower moving. The antibiotic resistance one and the climate change one and the biodiversity loss one. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there are level things Sweden can do at the domestic level. Technically, I would like... We, the other week, there was a press conference explaining the budget to children. Next year, I'd like to see a budget for children and, and we actually see at how the budget is divided ac across the generations and actually, s therefore, also into the future. Uh, I, I also happen to think that, uh, and that's sort of, there's a technical multi-sector leadership agenda. We, we will be launching, and this is a commercial, uh, a Lancet Commission. I, I had a, a potential to, to coordinate on the 20th of November uh, online. You can find it on UNICEF Sweden's homepage, uh, the link, where we actually argue that we need multi-sectoral governance at the local level, at the national, regional, and global level to tackle the, the drivers and and the megatrends to return to where you started from that really shape this pandemic and all the other ongoing pandemics and the big one, uh, the climate change one. Mm. So I, I think that's where Sweden could step in. And then finally, on, on the international before scene... You, before please. you go on, could you just give us a sense of the response that you've had to this idea? Uh, I, I think some countries are starting to to think about it. And, and uh, Norway, for instance, actually agreed to our suggestion to develop an optional protocol to the Convention on the Rights of the Child regulating harmful marketing to children. Whereas many other countries that were in the, the clause of the commercial determinants did not. Some of them uh, sort of outspoken right. uh, champions for children's rights. Uh, so I, I think there are issues that can be done technically. Uh, but, but I think the multi-sectoral governance, uh, it only works, in my view, at city level and municipality level. That why, that's why we see cities leading the charge, uh, I think, for the transformation. Because at national level, it's all siloed, except at the prime minister level. And we've already talked at the breakdown at the global level and, and the weaknesses there. So I think we have a way to go here, but I think we also need to set up good exemplars here. And that's where I think Sweden could help also through, through na national initiatives. Mm. But I think there's a global political leadership in this as well, because I grew up in the Cold War uh, version 1.0, and then there was something called the non-aligned movement of the countries that were in between the two adversaries. I think there's time for a non-maligned movement now for sustainable health. Mm. And, and I think that's a political uh, initiative that Sweden could take uh, and drive together with like-minded countries. Uh, I interrupted you before. Did you finish your point? You? That's it. Okay, super. Um, Jenny, uh, like it or not, you're the closest we have to uh, the public sector. <laughs> so uh, from what you've heard, um, 
But is there anything that strikes you as, as something that should be taken up uh, in, a, in a more formal way by the Swedish government? Um, and what are your own thoughts on, on where Sweden can take a lead? Yes, what I think uh, right now, from, from the Swedish perspective, uh, to keep on the track with the, with the global uh, perspective that Sweden has, the global access to vaccines uh, and that joint work uh, in the EU, I think that that is super important. It's super important to maintain uh, that base of leaving no one behind. Mm. That we, we are, even though no one wanted to work with Sweden in, 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 in some parts during the pandemic, we still reached out and said we will only be able to tackle this problem uh, on a global sense. So that, that is something that I think that we definitely need to maintain. Uh, on the long-term basis, uh, I'm uh, totally with uh, Ole Petter here, we need really to drive the science in this direction. There's so many things that we need to do better to be more agile in the development of science, also on a, uh, on a more holistic way. And I know how challenging that is. I'm, I'm running the uh, mm. Office for Life Sciences, which is cross-ministerial function within the government. But on midterm, what I really do think that Sweden can make a difference uh, on, on the international level is both to work with the uh, global value chains because we saw in the uh, start of the pandemic and we will probably see that during the course of the pandemic when it goes up and down uh, that the uh, medical technology, the production of ventilators here in Stockholm provides for the whole world. That value chain needs to work even though there is a lockdown. Mm. We need to find a solution for that. And also in midterm, I think that the uh, now when we uh, have many new solutions with vaccines, that are coming up, the, the, what Sweden could really contribute to is really to follow up, to have a uh, fast dis distribution and follow up. How does that really roll out? How does that really work? What are the, uh, the real world data uh, on, the, on the vaccine studies? Sweden could do that. Are we set for that? I don't mm. know. Olipet. Yeah, I would mm. like to follow up on the, the issue of vaccines because I think this will be the test for the society, not only the Swedish society, but for the global society. Because what we are up to now is a situation, and I'm glad we have MSD here, is a situation where we have to see how do we distribute vaccines in an equitable fashion to, to see to it that we distribute vaccines with the optimum effect. What we are seeing now uh, is a situation where it's very difficult for us as a research institution, to, to know how we should come up with advice as to how vaccines should be distributed internationally, globally, to have the best effect. Because mm. it's, it's absolutely hypothetical that we have enough vaccines for everybody from day one. That's a, an absolutely But the point is, question. now I'm looking at MSD and all other co uh, pharmaceutical companies as well, this work of ours is so difficult because we simply haven't got access to the information that we need to understand how vaccines should be distributed equitably with the optimum effect. What is going on now globally in regard to vaccines, and I'm not specifically addressing MSD, is that so much is shrouded mm. in, uh, let's say, in a mist. We don't simply have transparency sufficient to a sufficient degree to understand how we should come up with advice for vaccine distribution. We are looking at the situation now where we might end up in what is called uh, vaccine nationalism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We are very close to a major test for global solidarity. What's, what that's let's, the word you use. Let's see. Let's see how that goes. Stefan, did Can you I have build a build on the vaccine? Because uh, briefly, if you would, UNICEF, then we've got one more question. UNICEF just signed up to actually procure and distribute four billion doses. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we already, as UNICEF, uh, distribute two and a half billion childhood doses, and now it's going to be four billion COVID doses on top of that. Mm. But I, I think it's so obviously we need to figure out from a modeling perspective and, and the distribution. But there's also the logistics of this, and coming back to your currency, the trust. 
because it's only by building trust, and, and I think that trust is spelled through universal health coverage and building broader solutions and not just showing up at your doorstep wanting to stick a needle one day. You need to establish that trust. So going back to the last year's declaration on universal health coverage, which all the countries of the world signed up to, that's the currency we need to invest in now. And digitization and universe, good education, transforming education, connectedness, and universal health coverage. Those are measures to build trust that will allow us to carry out whatever distribution scenario we come up with. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, we're running out of time uh, far more rapidly than uh, any of us wants, I think. Uh, but that's the case. I did want to come back to this digitization thing simply because it cuts across so much else and it has been such a rapid and transformative change in, in all aspects of our lives. So, um, Jenny, I know this is a topic close to your heart, so I'm going to hand over to you and leave a very open question. Um, how can digitization help us meet this challenge? Well, what, what we have seen uh, so far is that when we didn't know how to find a solution, we turned to new digital ways and new digital tools in, in order to, to go there. When we couldn't the, uh, work with the, uh, everything from clinical trials to visit at the doctor's office, was Im immediately transformed in that way. What I think that we need to find new digital solutions for is for uh, creativity and co-creation, because that is something that I still think that we lack through the uh, digital infrastructure. And for that, I, th uh, that's an area where I would like to see much focus from the research institutes, for example, to work on what are the new ways of, of working for co-creation through a new digital infrastructure. What I do think is most important uh, from uh, going further on is how we utilize data, not the digital infrastructure as such, but the utilization of data and the implementation of intelligent decision support making uh, in that sense. I think that this is the only way in tac yeah. tackling uh, the, uh, the, the pandemic on a global scale. Mm. Um, you mentioned, uh, Ole Petter, before the, the opportunity for the collection of data that Sweden had through its schools sure. policy. What, what's your view more broadly on, on digitization and the role it can play? at a time like this? Well, uh, Jenny and I, we have been discussing this quite extensively. And of course, Sweden is in a fantastic position, as you alluded to, that because of the trust, people are willing to share uh, even health, sensitive health information for research purposes. Uh, we have a system that is uh, uniquely suited mm. for uh, the application of data for research purposes. Also, when it comes to preparedness for the ne next uh, pandemic, uh, to put it this way. So, uh, so here, absolutely, we have uh, uh, a golden opportunity. But there is a but always. Mm -hmm. And that is that, uh, of course, we have two moral imperatives here when it comes to the use of data, as we have been discussing extensively previously. One is, of course, to uh, uh, the privacy concern. I mean, this is a moral imperative. We should see to it that the privacy concern is attended to. But there is another imperative that uh, must be better balanced, I think, with the first one. And that is the moral imperative saying that whenever you have data that could provide a health benefit for the population at large, if we're allowed to do research on this data, yeah. Mm. then we should really allow this data to be subject to research. And I don't think, to be honest, that we have found the right balance here in Sweden as yet. Right. We have a resource that is not exploited optimally. Mm. And right. this is, of course, a task, <laughs> again, that we have to, uh, to work on in the time yeah, to come. I don't, I don't think Sweden is unique in that no, position I know, either. I know, yeah. I mm. uh, B, what's your... Yep. I totally agree. And we, I mean, GDPR has put a lot of, <laughs> it's really been stressful for when it comes to, to, to being better on data, but there are solutions. I mean, it's, it, it's not needed to be an object. I, I would remind you of Hans Rosling, our beloved Hans Rosling, who, who once said that you need to have the Excel sheet in one hand and you need to have a, a love for humans in the other hand. Mm -hmm. And I think Sweden is v very well equipped for mm -hmm. uh, handling that balance. You talk about the balance because that's exactly the balance that we need. And we have been living in a society with free speech and with high trust for so long time, so we kind of should take the, the lead when it comes to find this. When we asked in our COVID, uh, the World Radio Survey have has also done a COVID-19 study, and we have 
quite many countries coming in, and we have two very important questions when it comes to these things. One is on solidarity, whether, whether people feel that the, the development is more towards more solidarity or more hostility when it comes to COVID-19. How does it uh, affect the societies? And up in the Nordic countries, we're extremely high on solidarity. The other question is on, on whether uh, each country should solve their own problem when it comes to, to the pandemic or whether we should do it in cooperation. And we are skyrocketing when it comes to cooperation. So this is, these are very good arguments for why we should take on responsibility when it comes to fighting the pandemic by using very good data and doing very good analysis on the data. I mean, we're, we have a good, we're positioned there. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I think that's a great uh, point at which to uh, draw this part of the discussion to a close. I did promise at the beginning that I'd give each of you an opportunity uh, to sort of summarise and, and, and give some final words to us. So why don't we start at, at this end, at Jenny? I think that it has n n never been more... Uh never been clearer that health is really in the heart of geopolitics as a whole, as, as you pointed out so well today. And building resilience for the future, we need to focus on the health aspect and not only on the health care aspect. So move the, the, the framework that we have for working towards more prevention, mm -hmm. be, be more precise in our methods and working with healthcare. I think that that is still the way on, on going forward, but we need to do it through public-private partnerships. We need to have industry and the public sector uh, on the same side. Stefan? Mm. I, I like Ole Petter's global transformations for health and the governance for that, so I hope I don't steal your thunder on that one, but I'll leave it there. And then I'll say at the very micro level, it's about connecting the whole world connecting every school, connecting every health facility digitally. UNICEF has embarked together with Ericsson actually on mapping out how we can connect every school in the world now. Because I, I think it is that connectedness that is going to help us uh, actually tackle several of these challenges. Mm -hmm. Super. B. How do you fight combat uh, populism? Uh, I have a quotation which I think is in a way in the line with the answer. Even if we are pessimists in our brain, it's really easy to be that when it comes to the COVID-19 situation and other forthcoming pandemics. Even if we are pessimists in our brain, we need to be optimists in our heart because a pessimist wins whenever he loses. <laughs> That's a great point. I don't want to hear anything more after that. That's fantastic. Uh, but Oli, P Oli Peter, well, it's your turn. You have been talking about trust. And of course, trust is the glue that uh, provides the social cohesion. Mm. And I think we should really remember that. Mm. If we are looking at trust as a matter of social cohesion, mm. we have to do what we can to preserve trust. And to preserve trust is to counteract the deep inequities that we see mm. worldwide today. Mm. And that, has, that have been deepened by COVID-19. To see to it that these inequities don't propagate then, of course, what we have to do, this goes without saying, more research, more interdisciplinary research, more international collaboration when it comes to research, so that we can build, it's easy to say, universal preparedness for health. That is what is needed. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, all four. That's been a fantastic uh, discussion. Um, carried out at breakneck speed. Yeah. <laughs> So I would like to take the opportunity, I need to turn around. I, I would like to thank you, but with my back towards <laughs> you, I, I, I'm sorry in advance for this amazing brown bag lunch. I think my conclusions from today is continue to discuss, continue to collaborate on a local level as well as on, on a global level, because this is a global issue and a global challenge. And trust scientific data and leave no one behind. And those are my last words, and I hope you don't disagree. So thank you everyone for listening in today and thank you to the amazing panel. Thank you. Thank you.